Hey everyone, it's GT from Death Wears Bunny Slippers. It's my pleasure to introduce Chuck Penson, author of the Titan 2 Handbook. He has been involved in the Titan 2 for over a decade, for a very long time at the museum. Buy his book, go to the link in the description and do it right now, otherwise I'm going to nuke you and don't think I won't do it. Uh, anyway, awesome. Chuck's been great to uh, resource all these years on the project. Uh, so Chuck, take it away. Hi everybody, this is Chuck Penson, retired historian for the Titan Missile Museum in Tucson, Arizona. So this is a straight down shot. Looking at the, uh, the complex, you can see the visitor center there at the bottom of the screen and the silo at the upper right. Next to the silo with that long tank is the fuel hard stand and some of the shadows you can see there being cast by the various antennas and other poles on the complex. A little glint off the window there. In just a moment, we're going to take a flight over northwest of the silo to look at one of the azimuth alignment monuments. Here it is. There are two of these things. These are about 1,100 feet away from the silo, and you could put a target, a sighting target on these things. And uh, with a theodolite back at the silo, you could line up on these things, and you could use it to help align the guidance system on the missile. These were abandoned in 1979. These are on mining company property. In fact, we're out flying over the mining company property right now, so we actually are not supposed to go out there, but once in a while we'll venture out there and nobody says nobody says anything to us. Not sure what that little box is there. Probably some kind of electrical box having to do with the mining operation somehow. There's the, the uh, soft water reservoir we're flying over right now. Uh, and uh, headed out toward the silo right there. Another view of the silo right here and the fuel hard stand. And uh, visitor center will come into view in just a moment. And beyond that is the parking lot. And next to that to the left is the disc cage antenna. Here it is right here. This is a shortwave radio antenna and really had no specific role in EWO operations. It really was kind of a post-attack uh, antenna system designed to let the crew figure out what was left of the world. So they didn't use this every day. They used it mostly to uh, tune in WWV to set the uh, EWO clock in the control center. Covers from 3 to 30 megahertz. It's a beautiful antenna. If you're a ham radio operator, you can actually still use this. There's a cable that goes out to the parking lot. You can connect right to that. This little Jeep, uh, actually it was called a Mutt 150, um, is a Vietnam piece of equipment and really was not used in the Titan II program. Not sure how it got here or why, but we leave it here because people like to look at it. So, But just so you know, it had nothing to do with the, the Titan program. This is the fuel hard stand and the fuel holding trailer. The holding trailer is kind of a big thermos bottle. And what you would do if you wanted to load propellant is you'd take, come out here with a big tank truck and you'd offload your propellant into this tank. And then you'd connect a chiller unit to this thing and that would chill it down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it was at the right temperature, you could just load it by gravity uh, into the missile underground. One of really many pieces of equipment used in fuel handling that we only have this one. Here are the engines. This is stage one right here has the equivalent power of two 747s running at full throttle. There's stage two right behind, has 100,000 pounds of thrust. Stage one uses fuel at just a prodigi prodigious rate, about 1,600 pounds of fuel per second. Operates for two and a half minutes and then it's done. Take a swing around here and look at the silo. And then we'll kind of fly up on top of the silo here and try to look down the windows. Not easy to get a good, a good look down the windows in the daytime unless you kind of poke your nose right up on the glass there and shield your eyes. A lot of reflections due to the sun. But uh, there's a pretty good shot right down there. Window was really just put on to keep the rain out and to make sure you guys can get a good look down inside. Access portal looking down the stairwell. Sorry, we can't fly down there. And there's the elevator hatch at the upper right. This 
This is one of two General Electric pop-up antennas. This one is in the popped-up configuration. The antenna is in this section. It's right on, on top. That's just a big fiberglass uh, enclosure. The antenna is actually inside of that white thing. And right behind that, with the um, four-leg metal tower, is the primary IRCS antenna. This is the Delta T pole. And this was used to determine if there was a temperature inversion present over the complex. And that's important because if you're loading or unloading propellant and you have a spill, you want the fumes to go away rather than be held close to the ground by a temperature inversion. So there was a temperature sensor up on this little, uh, this little uh, platform on top, and there was another one six feet off the ground. And the difference in temperature between those two would tell you whether there was a temperature inversion on the complex. I'm a little surprised this whole pole hasn't blown down in a big thunderstorm. We had them tested about uh, 20 years ago. They took core samples and determined the poles were in good shape. But still, uh, I, after every big storm, I expect to come out here and find this thing laying on the ground. That platform, by the way, would never support the weight of a person anymore. At least I don't think so. I would certainly never go up there. Well, there you go. Thanks for looking, and uh, thanks for that wonderful video.